hoping that YouTube can hear me. That is the Hello, YouTube. Okay, I'm over on the live channel here. Oh, recording, that would be good too. We should do that. Not sure where you're picking this up. So let's uh, bring this down. Okay, that sounds good. I think that should... All right. Nobody is joining yet. He gads. It's 10.09. Oh, oh. Ah, okay. Somebody saw something. Good morning. Good morning. Ah, could someone do me a huge favor? I posted a YouTube link. And I'm hoping that the live link, people can actually hear the audio. And I just need someone to kind of double check that for me. Would that be great? Oh, you should hear uh, some game sound from the uh, little mayhem game that's going on up here. Is that uh, working? Is that a yes? Is that a yes? Let's see. Oh, yep, there's audio. Okay, that's good. All good. All right. Yeah. Of course, at the last minute, I can't. I have to tempt fate and try to throw some other exciting new thing in there. So hopefully, uh, this is going to be good. Um, it's always good. It's always good. So what's not to love about learning to program games, right? Or learning game programming, or something like that. It's the best course ever. Uh, or at least that's what I like to. I don't. Know. Let's see. So let me pop on over to the live channel here. It's, uh, let's see. Two, four, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. I think we're actually 27, which is pushing the limit of, um, I think that might actually be officially the limit on discord these days is 25 uh so maybe they they pulled back on that i think it was 50 for a while there because of pandemic and now they looks like they pulled it sort of back to um to 25 again so hopefully the combination of everything will make life a little bit more bearable because we have options and lots of options so let's see uh, all right let's see what time is it should we get started it's 10 11 we could uh oh where's my trivia cards okay hold on this is what we can do how's everybody doing is is uh you can keep your your mics uh and actually this will be helpful if you have your microphones on for the first portion of here um, this is dun, 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 the video game trivia deck. We'll test your prowess or of the, it's mostly video game history and some of it does go way back. Some of it's fairly recent. I think this, let's see, when was this made? This was made, oh, it looks like 2019. So it's not the newest thing in the world. So we'll start with a couple questions and then we'll kick off here. Uh, 
Owen, no fair, you may have heard these before, but if you haven't, then feel free to, sh to, to shout an answer out. It'll give me an idea as to how many people are paying attention. Juan Aquacate is the protagonist of which game? Juan Aquacate is the protagonist of which game? Juan Aguacate. That's a tough one. It's Guacamelee was the game. So I'm going to, let's see, pan pan this over or pull my, the microphone out a little bit. It's a good quality microphone, but the range is it. condenser microphones, which are, uh, excuse me, your dynamic, uh, I forget for condenser or dynamic these days, you know, basically uh, large pickup microphones. They sound a lot better. Hopefully this, the audio quality is pretty good. But it, uh, they tend to be very uh, spatially challenged sometimes. They, they want you to be generally near the microphone. Then they have really wonderful dynamic range in there. Uh, well, this one's, we're going to follow that up with an easy one. You should all know this. If not, you will know today. What is the name of the artificial intelligence in charge of the testing facility at Aperture Science in the 2007 video game Portal? Okay. Perfect. That was an that was an easy one. Uh, somehow I have, to, I have to track down Glados's uh, song from. You're all familiar with that one. That's a great. That is one of the the first the first uh, song. I think is just the best. It's just it's just classic. It's just it was such a, a wonderful moment in in pop gaming culture, gaming pop culture. Uh, just kind of all wonderfully was a cool moment. All right, so we've got a bunch of people, and we are recording, and we are on YouTube, and we are on uh, Discord. So I think that I think I'll count that as as being started. Now today, I started. I decided to get all formal today because I got I the great fortune this Christmas of of getting a a. a uh, can everyone see that? Can you make out what that is? It is my Pac Man tie, and I I I just had to take advantage of that. So. Don't worry, the, the, the tie or the, the, the formal appearance is probably not going to be a regular thing, unless you all are into that, in which case, you know, hey, we'll see, we'll see how it plays. We're going to be flexible here. We're going to make it up as we go along a bit. Um, all right, so welcome to Intro to Game Programming, a.k.a. GSAS 2540. This is, once again, the remote edition. Um, and let's see, let's make sure I'm getting everybody. Okay, yeah, looks like everything is, you know, if something is weird, I, you know, and, and suddenly things stop streaming, or if I'm, you know, if you wind up looking at my email on the screen or some other weird thing, and I've forgotten which screen I'm, please tell me right away in the interest of everybody. Um, that'd be great for us to kind of know what's what's going on there. That would be kind of cool. Um, so hopefully this, this we're going to keep going. Intro to Game Programming, GSAS 2540, the remote edition, spring 2021. Day one, what's the plan? What to expect, what you should expect out of the course, and what I expect in return, and the contracts that we will have between us, and how we will make this a fun and meaningful semester, um, and hopefully get as much, if not more, out of it than we normally would. Every semester, we, you know, we refine the process and figure out what's going on, and uh, uh, kind of to meet the needs and, uh, you know, obviously the gaming industry and the gaming tools, everything is constantly changing and improving. So we aim to improve along with it. So who is this class for? You may be asking yourselves, uh, many of you, I'm sure this is a required class. So you're saying, well, it's obviously this class is for me, but it's designed for anyone wanting or needing to understand firsthand what it means to program games which normally we take to mean all GSAS majors, um, and not only what it means to program games, but what it means to potentially work with people who are programming games, who are game programmers. Maybe you're not a programmer yourself, and that's okay. This isn't, you know, really going to necessarily be, you know, the uh, super weed out the good programmers from the bad program. That's not the purpose of this course. It's really to give you you know, the background to understand, you know, kind of certain common things that you're going to be working with or encountering as you are either doing game programming yourself or you're working with game programmers to realize your visions, right? 
Now, this isn't a computer science course. You probably mostly have already taken uh, CS1, the majority of you, I think. Um, so experience is desired, but generally not required in this class. Some of you might now be taking, if you are a CS major, you might be taking data structures now. So I feel your pain. That's, that's certainly a course that has a, a reputation. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, that's great knowledge and that will be lots of applicable stuff. So there will be lots of crossover between computer science stuff and this class, but generally like to prefer or like to kind of assume that you're kind of coming at this fresh. And, uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, no, no conflict there. If you haven't, or you're, you know, you're not a programmer, don't worry. All right. There's going to be a wide range of backgrounds in here. So we'll use that to our advantage. So we want to see it from as broad a set of perspectives as we can. Now, what that means in terms of, you know, it's kind of challenging. This is always challenging when you've got a large group of people from diverse backgrounds to say, well, okay, what is, what are the common denominators? Where are we all coming from? Hey, if people in this course have never programmed before, but other people have, you know, maybe you've done a Unity game or two, and that's cool, you know. So there are certain minimums in the class, certain concepts that you're going to need to demonstrate, certain projects you're going to need to do, but there aren't necessarily sort of maximums, right? So if you want to go above and beyond or you want to make your project amazing, that's really, really great, and we like to see that. However, you do need to demonstrate mastery of the basics, right? Uh, if you can read, uh, you know, Greek literature that's in ancient, you know, dialects that are, you know, sort of amazingly obscure and wonderful and, you know, demonstrate some really crazy advanced knowledge of ancient Greek literature, but you don't know the Greek alphabet, you know, that's, that's, Kind of, it can happen and that can be problematic. So in this course, we want to make sure, and sometimes, you know, that's, that means you'll have to kind of go back and, and maybe, you know, kind of clearly demonstrate something that you might be taking for granted if you are an experienced programmer, but you want to demonstrate mastery of the basics so that we know that we have, you know, kind of good programming practices, good conceptual and architectural practices and so on when it comes to game programming. Okay. So no minimums. No, uh, there are minimums. Yeah, there are minimums, but no maximums. All right. So introductions. Let's see how we can do this. This is always tricky, especially in the times of remote learning. So, uh, and this is one of the, this is the larger sections. So what I'm hoping, uh, because it's, it really, it, it, it hurts me deeply uh, in that uh, if, if I don't get you to chime in now, or at least I don't get to see your face, I'm going to stare at everybody's camera. So I'm going to encourage everyone to take their camera off uh, or excuse me, sorry, put their camera on and we'll keep it really, really, really simple. We're just going to say, hello, introduce yourself so everybody can, you know, kind of put a, uh, a name with a face and what your concentration within GSAS is. And if you're not a GSAS student, please tell us what your major is. I know there is a, there are a few people, there's always a couple, you know, we try to, you know, keep the class open to get, you know, again, some kind of the uh, uh, various, you know, diverse backgrounds. So don't be surprised if there are a few people who are not, you know, I'm sure the majority are first year GSAS students, but there's going to be a few who aren't. And I'm going to sort of just, I don't know if, if your Hollywood Squares Brady Bunch kind of orientation on the screen here is the same as mine. So I'm just going to call out people's names and uh, in terms of you know, kind of going left to right, top to bottom ish. So in my upper left corner, currently I see Ben. Hello, Ben. Oh, well, well Ben, you get to introduce yourself. And I guess the one other thing I'd like to know, I should have mentioned this is, are it looks like, are you in a dorm room or are you home? Okay, so you're if you're on campus or you're uh, at home or what time zone you're in, that's good things to know. So Andrew, you kind of came in right as Ben was talking, so, but now you're in the upper left corner, so I've got to go back to you. Andrew W, your, your mic is muted, but we want to just introduce yourself. Okay. And what's your, oh, you said CS. Okay. Next up, Benny. Oh. Thanks. All 
I see Brandon up next. And Emily, you're next. Oh, I think you're muted or your mic isn't working. Okay. I'll we'll, we'll, you'll work that out and I'll go to Gwen. Great. Hi, Gwen. Emily, are you microphoned yet? Oh. We'll come back. Jeremy. Oh, another mic problem. <laughs> All right. Well, come. Oh, yes. Is that Emily? Hi, Emily. Okay. Jeremy, we're going to let Emily go. It's okay. No, we see a, a, just a, a drawing at the moment. A pretty cool drawing. Yes. Great. Jeremy, how are you doing? Any luck with the microphone? No? No luck? We'll go to Jackie then. So it's late night for you there then, I guess, right? Or, or early, let's see. Yeah, it's about third. Okay. Um, next up, and Jeremy, if your mic comes online, just just give a shout out. If I've like gone to you but then gone away, just give a shout when you think you're. Are you think you're? Are you good? Uh, all right, Joseph. Good to have you. You're one of those non GSAS folks. Okay. Got to be representing then. You know, no pulling the punches. Ken, how are you doing? Okay, let's see. Next up, Laura. Cool. Leon. Okay. Lu Yang. Good to have you. Thanks for staying up late. Madeline? Good to have you. Matt? All right, Max, I have swirling cubes for you. <laughs> ah, okay. Michael. Okay. Owen, how are you doing again? <laughs> All 
Great. And Owen is living proof that I can't be that bad because I've had Owen in a bunch of classes and, and he's still, I know they're all required classes for the most part. So I can't take too much. I can't draw too much of a conclusion, but uh, he survived. I guess that's at least he looks healthy. Uh, so we're, we're, we're doing okay. So, um, and that brings me to another point and I, and I just realized this and it's not in the case of, it's not Owen specifically, but, um, one of the things that I've asked people to do, and I see some people already have, uh, and I will, uh, recommend so that we can, you know, get this, uh, taken care of pretty quickly, uh, names and preferred pronouns and how you want to be addressed and so on. Obviously it's, it's early on in the semester. We're all getting to know one another. We're not going to know quite for sure. Uh, I know I'll make mistakes. Uh, hopefully not too many, uh, you know, once or twice, if you, if you do need to correct me, or if you need to, you know, kind of let people know how you want to be addressed, what pronouns, what, you know, what your name is, what your given name is versus what you prefer to be called and so on. That's good to know. Cause we want to get to know one another. We're going to be, we're part, you're part of a, um, what's the word? Uh, I always forget. It's a really fancy word. You're, you're part of a, uh, you know, you're, well, we'll just say class, but you're going to be working together on through the course of lots of things, especially as you get into game dev one, game dev two, and all the other courses. So you're going to want to become, you know, a, a community of, of people who all, you know, potentially are working together on different things. So it's important to have, you know, information there, give us the clues, you know, at least like, you know, in your, um, in your nickname for the discord channel, put your RCS ID. So this way I can kind of put, you know, do the, the housekeeping I need to do with regards to getting your, your uh, grades associated with you as the person on campus and also, you know, what you want to be called, what pronouns and so on. Okay. Sorry about that. So going on from Owen, we had Sam, the second Sam, right? Good to have you. And Sean? Oh, one second. We'll come back to Sean. Oh, okay. Excellent. Thomas. Thomas Casal. Do we have two Thomas? No, we have one Thomas. Are you having a microphone moment or? Or is your camera frozen? This is one of those awkward moments. Wait. I've lost him. So while Thomas is coming back, Evelyn. Okay, Thomas, are you back? No problem. Okay, let's see, we're getting there. Jack. Okay. And that's a good point. Data structures is important, especially if you are considering a CS, CS dual, your performance in there can make it much easier uh, to get the CS dual, which is going to make it much easier to fulfill all the requirements of the CS concentration. More or less, if you wind up taking the, the CS concentration, it's, it's just an administrative issue whether or not you get a dual degree in GSAS and CS. So it's kind of, you want to be in that position because it's, it, you know, more or less uh, enough courses cross over and it makes your life much easier, actually, if you go ahead and take care of that, kind of get, get the dual paperwork and things lined up uh, early on and things. So very good point. Um, so let's see, did we, did I, I interrupted between Jack and Joseph, right? Joseph? Oh, oh, you have. Okay. Sorry. It must've like, Every so often it repopulates and re re goes here. Uh, Laura. Okay. 
Oh, you did. Wow. Okay. Everything is, I'm going to, it's, it's beginning. Yes. Is, uh, so Nick, I don't think Nick is gone. Okay. Now, have I gotten everybody who is on? Shout out now if I haven't come to you and uh, either that or you can go like right under the radar. Yes. Uh, Jeremy, if I, sorry. <laughs> okay. Wow, that was a bunch. Did we get everybody? I think. All right. So I'll I'll what the heck? I'll I'll introduce myself now. Now you can feel free keep your it's it's up to you if you want to keep your uh, if you want to keep your cameras on, that's great. If you want to mute your microphones at least, just to kind of make sure that we don't wind up with any echoes and background noise, that's cool. Um, if you feel more comfortable typing in questions over on Discord, I have like Lots of monitors and windows open. Uh, I feel like air traffic control over here sometimes. Um, so I'm going to be pay trying to pay attention. If you are watching on YouTube, uh, I may not see your YouTube comments. I do see the live chat. That's over there on yet another monitor. So I've got Discord comments over here and YouTube comments over there and watching for, for other cues. So if worse comes to worse and you don't see me responding, you can always like try to wave your hands or or just turn your microphone on and shout out something. I'm totally fine being interrupted. I do tend to, I wouldn't say ramble, but I will say that I, 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 I talk without breathing half the time. I've been accused of, you know, people worried I'm going to like pass out because I, I forget to take breaths. Um, so that's, that's just me. So, so we want to keep it a little bit, um, interactive and live and so on. Feel free to ask questions and jump in at any point. So I'm Eric Amaris. Uh, Amaris rhymes with glamorous. So I like to get that out of the way because it is a very mispronounced uh, last name. So if you are if you can pronounce glamorous, you know how to pronounce Amaris. So that's me. Um, how you want to refer to me? Uh, well, for starters, we'll start out with, it could be Dr. Amaris, Professor Amaris. We'll start with that. And as we all get to know each other, we'll figure out if we can, you know, what levels we can go down. Um, so along the lines, I am an RPI student through and through. Uh, I got my undergrad at RPI way back in the day. We'll say when that was. More recently, that was actually in, in computer and systems engineering, CSE. So those of those of you who are uh, at least one out there. Uh, so that was my bachelor's many years ago. Uh, more recently, I also did a master's in computer systems engineering. Uh, but very fairly recently, in 2018, I decided, well, what the heck, I will get a PhD in cognitive science. So the reason I kind of advertise this is that I feel having a broad background is one of the things that kind of uh, entices, enticed me to get into the GSAS program and to get involved with it, uh, because it is such an interdisciplinary and, and kind of, you know, interesting course because, or interesting major, because there are so many different backgrounds and different ways to approach it. Even if you want to take a, you know, very technical approach, there's, there's lots of meat on the bones there for you. Or if you want to bring art to it, or if you want to bring music and sound and cognitive science and AI, lots and lots of different uh, ways to approach it. Now, I'm also a fairly recent RPI parent. So I feel, I know what that pain feels like as well. I have students who graduated in 2016 and 2018, both within uh, actually, the EMAC, H HNSS, and uh, management program. I don't know if we had any management uh, concentrations out there. I'm not sure I heard anyone mention that, but uh, familiar with that program. Uh, also had a, had a, a child, uh, now I say child, but had someone go through in the CS program as well. So we know all the professors and stuff and, and issues in there. So firsthand experience of what it's like for someone to feel miserable going through data structures and all those great courses. So what that means is ask me anything. I'm here to help not just with this course. Uh, within GSAS, chances are you're going to have, we're going to encounter each other in different courses in different ways. I'll wind up maybe being some of your advisors and that sort of stuff. But I'm I'm happy to try to help from whatever perspective I can, whether it's, you know, strictly this class or wherever you go or help, you know, to kind of get you through the program or, you know, uh, opportunities on campus and research and all that kind of stuff. Just ask. Okay. Um, 
my background, just a little bit to talk about, you know, where my perspective comes from in terms of game development specifically, is that I develop tools, uh, predominantly middleware tools. So those are the kind of things that you don't realize you use, but you used um, uh, in a lot of games and platforms. Uh, I've done it for Atari, did it for Sega, Sony, Microsoft, Apple, Adobe, Google, lots of different things. Um, so uh, it's it's kind of an interesting thing about some portions of game development, you wind up being sort of, or even CS and lots of other fields, you wind up being sort of the invisible authors behind things. You know, you're sometimes the the work that you do in creating a great simulation or a great piece of software, the better it is, the less people tend to notice it, which is kind of cool. And on the one side, you know, they, they only notice it when it goes wrong, when the game glitches or the, like the video didn't look good or something like that. So this kind of uh, an interesting middleware world that you can wind up living in. So I've done a bunch of that sort of stuff. Uh, my favorite games, I, I'm a big fan of adventure and survival horror type games. Usually I ask everyone to kind of talk about the games that they like to do. And that's the introduction channel over on Discord. We're going to use for that so that uh, people can kind of, you know, see, well, you know, do you, you know, what's, what's the latest game, get the latest news. I, I'm always looking for new games to play um, and, you know, to, to do different stuff. Uh, currently, actually, I had to put Dungeons and Dragons 5e to the top of the list here, which is, it's it's not a video game, but it's certainly, you know, now it's online. I'm using Roll20.net. Um, I've DM'd as well as played on Roll20. And it's really, really interesting. I find it, you know, a, a really fun platform and it combines, you know, things in a very different way. It's not like developing a game in Unity, but there's opportunities of using technology in different ways. And and as a DM, there's even, you know, extensions and scripting and macros and Python. You know, there's, there's things to be done there as well. And we're obviously, you know, using technology and video streaming and voice chat and all kinds of different things. So it's kind of, kind of fun. So I like games that aren't video games uh, as well, like board games and so on. Big fan of, fan of like Camel Cup was a good one. Uh, Exploding Kittens we just played this week. I think a bunch of different things. But video game wise, um, Animal Crossing is one we have uh, always ready to go uh, on this Nintendo Switch in our living room. Uh, I like playing Alien Isolation, Bioshock, Intergalactic Mining, Borderlands, Zelda, you know, all sorts of different things. So I, I like lots of lots and lots of different perspective. I listen to all kinds of different music and so on. So you'd be surprised. So Again, feel free to ask me about anything. Um, happy to get into that. And you can ask me about Lego sometime. You may have noticed I have a, a particular uh, interest, love of, you know, respect for Lego. And I can talk for hours about that. If there any, any Lego fans out there, any thumbs up? Okay. There's bound to be some. No one's going to admit it, but everyone loves Lego, right? So if you need to reach me normally... We'd say, well, my office is over in West Hall, 312. Hopefully someday, probably by this summer, it will be over there as well. I currently am across the river from Troy uh, over in a little place called Latham or Colony, depending on uh, who you ask. Uh, but I'm just, uh, you know, basically 10 miles away from campus. But I'm one of those people considered to be um, at, or at risk due to some, you know, medical things. So uh, I get the, the joy of being off campus until this kind of works out. So if you need to get a hold of me, easiest thing to do is, of course, electronically. Um, my sort of online persona, a lot of the time, is this thing called Eraser Mice. So if you look, you've probably seen maybe uh, various handles. So if you if you look for Eraser Mice, not Eraser Mike, but Eraser Mice, you can find me. Uh, I have a YouTube. My main YouTube channel is called Learn Max, and there's a lot of different materials on there. So you can kind of find me through there. Um, so I'll be posting lots of stuff in different ways, but... Discord, I have found to be because, well, hey, it's it's meant to be a kind of online, you know, it's a very popular platform for gaming and interactions and so on. Um, a little bit more back and forth, a little more kind of conversational than things like Twitch and so on. So makes a perfect, seems like a perfect platform. Spend a lot of time hanging on around there. Um, officially office hours, I'm trying to make them Tuesday and Friday, but kind of between the two sections of intro to game programming. But as probably Owen will uh, uh, mention, uh, will hopefully back me up on. Uh, pretty much, if you post on Discord and I see it, I'm you know going to try to uh, get to it and acknowledge it. And it, it tends to be, I wouldn't say 24 seven, but uh, I try to be as responsive as I can. All right. So even though we're all remote, we want to be engaged and and interactive and so on. So there's always like fun stuff. 
Ah, someone's asking about what's going to the, this year's Lego Star Wars UCS set. Hmm, that's an interesting. I, I haven't kept up. I've I've fallen into. I've I, I went back and forth. I got the UCS. You know, I've got the 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 big um, Millennium Falcon. I haven't actually built it yet. I'm more a creator export city kind of focused person these days. But I I dabble in all sorts of different Lego uh, um, genres. But the, this uh, someday anyway. Okay, distractions. I'm also easily distracted. For those of you out there, um, there's also, and particularly in this in this uh, trying times, you know, it's, it's obviously it's tricky being remote, being you know, trying to 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 be in, uh, engaged and so on. Uh, I am familiar with how easily distractions uh, and trying to stay on target and stay focused and stay up to date and so on. How that is, it's a struggle I deal with every day. Um, so I can, I can, uh, uh, understand people's, uh, uh, challenges in that as well. So if you are encountering any sort of issues with regards to online learning and remote streaming or, you know, whatever, um, I can hopefully help with, uh, or at least I, I can empathize and, and, and hopefully get, uh, things put in, in certain ways that can kind of help with that also I helped a couple of different people through so far. I haven't. Um, I've been having good luck helping students with those areas as well. Anyway, okay. Look, a squirrel. That's my famous line, right? The LMS Blackboard system. We're going to be using LMS quite a bit, uh, especially, again, because of pandemic. Uh, we're going to be using it a lot. It is clunky. It's, you know, we have various complaints about it. But, you know, it is your friend. It is there. So I assume most of you have already seen it. Uh, most of the submissions here, we're going to be submitting things in two ways in this class. Your grades and so on are going to appear on LMS and you'll be able to like, you know, stay up to date in terms of, you know, the postings of content and so on. Uh, so there usually will be some sort of submission for the projects, uh, on LMS. It may not be like, oh, package up the game and put it on LMS or package up your code, put it on LMS. That's usually not going to happen. But there are going to be submissions, usually be like text or some design documents or kind of you know paperwork, that sort of thing that LMS will be used for. And we're going to be using tools directly within Unity and uh, yeah, within Unity to really facilitate the back and forth and submission of projects and things on there, which is way, 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 way more flexible. And it's a real world kind of collaboration platform for developing video games. So we're going to use the two kind of together. All right. The course syllabus and schedule are on LMS and they are live published documents. What I mean by that is they are Google documents. I like to post links so that I don't have to update things in lots and lots and lots of different areas so that if I find something wrong in a document, I can you know change it and there it is. Or even if we wanted to change something in this presentation, um, uh, I can you know change it in here. So this is literally uh, the link to this document is on LMS. And if you happen to be, have it open there, you would be watching the exact most up-to-date version, right? So mind blowing. This is all, you know, live and so on. Uh, there is a textbook for the class. It is a recommended, but optional textbook. Uh, it is, you know, these days, you know, it's, it's getting further and further sort of out of being, you know, the latest and greatest version of unity. However, um, in terms of the basics and term, in terms of the concepts, it's, still a good book. Uh, and especially if you are brand new to things or you feel a little bit uncomfortable, you're not quite sure, you know, you're worried, oh, how am I going to follow along? Maybe I need some additional resources. It's, it's good for that. You know, it's got some good structure and so on. Um, but is it absolutely positively required? No. Um, in fact, there are so much resources out there these days. And now Unity Learn Pro is free and there's so many YouTube, you know, so so this book is, you know, if you like having something that you just, you know, it's structured, it's there, it has those core concepts, it goes into more than just Unity as well. It is talks a little bit about game design and prototyping and so on. It's a good solid book. So if I, I highly recommend it, I own it. Um, but, you know, if do you absolutely need to buy it? Are you going to be lost without it? No, um, but it's recommended, but optional. All right. Parts of this slide didn't load. Well, that's a new one. Um, show anyway. Oh, I don't know why my cool cut and pasted graphic didn't. Uh, let's see what's up with that. That's interesting. Let's present that. Weird. We've discovered a bug in Google Slides. So, 
All right, I'm going to go to full screen because why not? That'll work too. Uh, well, I won't go to full screen. I'm going to go here. Uh, there we go. And uh, I lost it again. That is so bizarre. What is it about that graphic? Interesting. So what is in that graphic? I'll just tell you. Let's see. Maybe we can go back again. Let's coax it out here. There it is. All right. Strange. Technology. Got to love it. Okay. So Unity platforms. This is one. We're going to talk a little bit more about Unity. You've heard me say it a couple of times. So this is one of those upfront things. I'm sure there's probably someone, uh, at least one, probably a couple who are nervous in the back. of So we want to get this one out there right away. Unity platforms. Um, generally, we assume that people have a, a, a laptop, a Windows laptop. G generally, that's because, of course, the school likes to, you know, offer laptops and most of the, the school um, issued laptops and or, or, you know, once you bought through the school, likely are Windows computers. Um, that's certainly not a requirement, though. So officially, Unity has minimum requirements and Unity does support at least in preview, it even supports Linux. That's a relatively new addition. Uh, it makes me a little bit nervous, a little bit nervous when someone says preview, support in preview. Um, so if you can, um, it's great to be in Windows because we know that's, you know, just sort of, like I said, we generally prefer Windows because it just works, right? No problems. Windows, Visual Studio 2019, boom, it all is just going to, it just works. That's kind of the main path. Uh, personally, I've run Unity in, in OS X up until Big Sur. And Big Sur is a little bit of a weird, you know, there's some changes going on in, in Apple world with regards to processors and the latest generations of Mac Pros and so So, mm, you know, we're again, we're kind of getting a little bit weird there now as well. But in normal MacBook Pros and so on, that has just worked, more or less. Linux is in preview. So... Uh, if you are diehard and want to be on Linux, we'll do our best to get there. But you know, it you know, we, we'd like to kind of focus on the, the the learning issues as opposed to the tech support issues. So if you are on a Mac or you're on Linux, you're you may have to do a little bit more tech support on your own and a little bit more, you know, finding out things to make sure it works. Or you know, you're probably familiar with that from maybe from other courses as well. But we'll we'll do our best. We like to. I like the challenge, that sort of thing. All right, I'm going to go jump back, hopefully jump back to this, this mode. And look, now it works. What do you know? Weird. So computers, they're magic half the time. All right. Get that out of the way. So let me know. What is game programming? It's game programming to many people. These days, it's it's become more and more of a, you know, kind of a, uh, interesting question, I think, in a lot of cases, because some people, you know, you work with an engine like Unity and other game engines, even Unreal and and uh, various things online, and and you sort of sometimes less and less you hear these things. It's like I didn't have to write a single line of code, and I developed Final Fantasy twenty five, or I, you know, the the latest version of this game. I did it over a weekend with just assets, and I never once wrote a line of code. Now, that's great and all. And I, I applaud the people who did that. But ultimately, I don't see coding as a line of code sort of issue. I see coding as a way of basically getting the computer to do what you want it to do through whatever communication means that you have. Normally, the tradition has been that there would be, you know, sort of some language involved and sort of, you know, text based languages are the norm. But these days, that is changing. Um, there are visual programming languages. There are, you know, kind of non-traditional programming languages. And we also hear this term called scripting, which sounds like something yet different even from coding. So is, is coding and scripting, are they the same thing? So was, what would make something, what would make scripting different than coding? And, and how is how do those reflect, reflected to programming? So with regards, again, to this course, call it what you will you know, decide, you know, we'll use those terms fairly interchangeably. Sometimes they do have some subtle differences. You know, scripting tends to be a higher level than coding might be. Programming might be the, you know, the most hardcore thing. But ultimately, it's the process of taking some algorithm, some 
recipe, some procedure, and encoding it using some type of notation, generally a programming language, so that it can be executed by a computer. All right, so we're going to use it in a very broad sense. In a lot of cases, it is going to be we're going to write code. So you're all going to have an opportunity, like it or not, hopefully like it, to write code. Um, and we're going to have some opportunity to do that the traditional way, as well as in non-traditional ways as well. So you might be saying, so, but I'm gonna, I don't want to write code. I'm an artist. I'm a writer. I'm a musician. Why should I have to worry about this? Now, chances are even among the people who would consider themselves or who are the CS majors, the reason they're in GSAS is because they also have a lot of these creative ideas. They have some intuition and some insight into artistic and uh, narrative and music and, you know, all these different processes and these different outlets that they're sort of bringing to it as well. They're not, you know, strictly approaching it from the point of view of computer science. Now, being a straight, strict computer scientist, that's great as well. I mean, nothing, uh, this, I'm not saying this against pure computer science. I just mean, when you approach this from a GSAS perspective, you're already kind of thinking about, well, what are we going to use this for? What in sort of a creative or performative or simulation, there's some clue right there that, you know, because you're approaching it from the games perspective or the simulation perspective that you, you're bringing a little bit of preconceived notions and preconceived ideas and intent to the table. All right. So here in this class, everybody is going to need to do a little bit of bring some creative juice to the table, right? Even if you don't think you'll be a coder, though, you will be working closely with coders or the people who are going to you know, get your stuff to work as in the course of, you know, being in the game industry. So you want to know the lingo. You want to know, you want to talk the talk, walk the walk, have the respect of your peers in industry so that, yeah, okay, I know what's involved, right? I know what's involved in turning this really awesome character concept into something that's playable on the screen. Because often part of that process, the how it gets done, the way, you know, the things that are going on in the engine and the behaviors and the physics and so on, that's going to impact your character design. You know, if you had something that is is a, is a floaty, light, willowy, wispy character, that's going to have to be not just you know, a piece of artwork that you give someone and you hope they do the right thing. There's going to be some give and take. How is that actually going to happen? What are the mechanics that are going to be involved and so on? You might have said, well, okay, um, you know, it's uh, imagine they you know, it's half gravity or double speed for them. How would that work? You know, that, that sort of thing. So it's good to be able to kind of have some inkling, some intuition as to how these things really happen in the machine, how they get, they get to work, right? So sooner or later, your creative output is going to come alive in a game via somebody's programming efforts. In some, some way, we're going to, you know, have to get these behaviors communicated to the computer so it can do stuff with it, right? And some of this is going to be learning about how to talk about these things, how to communicate with and among coders, how to share ideas, how to structure things in such a way so that your different assets can move throughout the game development process and so on, right? This isn't game development, intro to game development. This is intro to game programming. So mm, we're going to be, there's going to be certain parts of it that might feel a little bit more intro to game development. I don't think we have an official, um, we have an official course that's intro to game development. I don't, think that's an official course title, right? I'm always forgetting. Okay. So because we have, you know, there, there can be this myth of clear definitions or silos, right? I can be just a programmer. I can be just an artist. I can be just a producer, or just a writer. The reality is that everything's mixed, right? There's lots and lots of blurry edges and you can go back and forth and you may need to test your game and you need to help with the artwork and you may need to tell someone, hey, actually, if you could, you know, you want this to look like really cool pixel art, it needs to be, you know, done in such a way, you know, it needs to be at this resolution or otherwise, you know, as I move it across the screen, do you want it to move on boundaries? Do you want it really to look like it's running on a 320 by 240 screen or do you just want your pixel art assets to be used in a smooth way in a much higher resolution environment. You know, all of those things would be kind of constant discussions back and forth and thoughts about, okay, how do these things wind up on there? That's the reality of, of game development, all right? Whew. All right, a moment of breath, all right. Any questions? Probably not, hopefully not. Maybe not so far, all right. Programming though, 
Ultimately, programming is about rules and data, actions and objects, right? We, we create some set of rules, some, some thing that is going to use those rules, and then we're going to feed it data, and it's going to react in response to that data, right? Um, you know, mix these variables, and it's going to be presented with these variables, or, or jump if the user did this sort of thing, and then the user's going to provide some data through an input device, and the the character is going to jump because of that, or an enemy is going to see you because it knows a set of coordinates, and it's going to do something in response to that, right? So these rules and data, rules and data are probably a more straight computer science term. Actions and objects, now we're sort of crossing the, the Rubicon into the game piece of things, right? We want objects to perform actions, right? So these things sort of have this notion of being entities that are doing things in sort of relatable ways, right? One of the coolest things about game programming right away is that in a lot of programming courses, probably in CS, in your intro to CS or CS1 course, you wrote a lot of stuff that involved text, right? You'd import text, or you'd be given some text, or some a set of you know a text file that would be read, and the computer program would see that, take it, interpret it, give you some output. Right? Um, it was text in, text out, ninety nine times out of hundred, probably. I'm not aware of anyone using audio and stuff in CS1. In game programming, almost right away, there's these this notion of sound and graphics and visuals and so on, and this sense of immersion and, you know, kind of interaction and kind of relatability, right? So that immediately we're working in an environment that is much richer and much more compelling and it feels more active and reactive and interactive than probably what you have seen in, in uh, most other kind of introduction CS courses. Whew. So that's, that's, this is an intro course. It's going to be a piece of cake, of course. So uh, still can be scary, it can be daunting. You know, here's, this is not C-sharp code here necessarily. I think, uh, what did I grab some uh, C++ or I, I forget where this goes. For me, I'm, I come, sorry. So from my perspective, I, I've had to deal with enough different languages. So I find that everything that sort of started off and was influenced by C, and in, in there I, I include C, C++, C Sharp, and even Java and JavaScript and you know Python. I, 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 I like to find the similarities as opposed to focusing on too much on the differences of different programming languages. So I like to think that, yeah, you know, if you get good programming skills, you will you know, no, it's not going to be a big deal for you to go, oh, you know, today we're going to work in C sharp, tomorrow we're going to work in C++. Yeah, there's going to be things we have to remember, you know, certain practices and things. But, you know, generally, if we develop, we, you know, respect and good practices on a conceptual level, we'll find that our skills can translate across different different platforms as well. But yeah, there's going to be code and we're going to argue over crazy things like line endings and where the semicolon should go and comments and, and so on and so on. So don't be daunted by this. You know, it can tend to be a little bit scary, especially if you're coming from a non-computer background, right? The tools and especially Unity are designed to be relatively low barrier to entry and fairly forgiving and welcome welcoming, even though we're going to be writing C-sharp code. So congratulations. We're going to get a, hopefully a, a, a pretty good complement of good CS skills and talk about object-oriented programming and inheritance and you know, event systems and programming patterns and so on, but in a way that hopefully makes it a little bit more fun and enjoyable because we're in, a, in an engine that's not necessarily designed to be um, scary. Powerful, but not scary. So... Maybe I've already diffused the programming is hard uh, thing. That's what I try to do here, right? Um, it, it will be challenging. It will be, you know, uh, uh, sometimes feel non-forgiving. You know, you're going to have to think, get things just right and remember, oh, it's, you know, oh, I needed to declare that as a public variable, not a private variable, which is soon by default. Or is that, should that be a protected class and so on? There's going to be some of that. Yeah, there's going to be, you're going to need to focus on the nitty gritty details sometimes to get things to work, right? 
So that's the CS piece of things. There's going to be some, some challenging pieces. And I mentioned this before, the game programming difference is this notion of interaction, 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 right? It's not give the computer something to do, and later on we get the results back, right? And even the, when we say simulations, often you can run a computer simulation that might be, you know, simulated annealing or a simulation of, you know, the way that a, a virus might spread through a population. Too soon? I don't know. Um, run that on the supercomputer. Run, you know, those, those are simulations that might be meant to run as quickly as they can. Maybe they run in real time. Maybe they run faster than real time. But the time scale is not important there. It's really just that they're a simulation. Maybe they have some concept of the time it takes to do something if you're running weather simulations or hydrology, whatever. But in game programming, the time scale and the other scales that we're working on directly relate to the person who's using the program generally, right? In time and space, right? We want things to be, you know, we're thinking about things that are responsive, things that have uh, the type of interactions that people can understand and pick up quickly, right? So this kind of these spatial interactions, this kind of affordances, these ideas that you can immediately relate to. You look at the screen, north is north, south is south. You know, your your controls are familiar. The way that your character moves is intuitive and so on because we have these relationships and these interactions that we're prepared to deal with, that we bring to it. We have this human scale. So interactivity is very, very, very important to what's going on. And a lot of the tools and the way we program is affected by the need for that. Right. So Hooray, we are using Unity and C-sharp for this course. This is, you're gonna have other opportunities to either use other um, other tools in, I know like in Game Dev 1, we immediately, we do a Unity project, we do an Unreal project, we do a Godot project. Um, so, you know, past, I think Game Dev 1, even then you start to get in where like, okay, what platform do you wanna use? What tools do you wanna use? And it'll be driven more by you know, what you're trying to accomplish as opposed to the earlier on courses where we're saying, well, we have to, you know, teach concepts and so on. So we're going to go with a, a particular engine right now. All right. So we're going with Unity. And the standard programming scripting we're going to be doing is in C sharp. There's some other options. I forget even now that there was like, it used to be JavaScript. We don't even talk about JavaScript in, in Unity anymore for some strange reason. Um, so it's Unity and C sharp. That's what we're going to deal with. But wait, but hold on. Put a pin in that one for a moment. Okay. Um, if you haven't already, you're going to go to the Unity store or the Unity website, and you're going to want to get a student license. You don't want to get the personal license, even though they kind of work similarly. The student license is better. The student license is better because you get actually more stuff with the student license. You get more seats in Unity Team Collaborate. You get access to more different things. So get the Unity student license. They're going to offer you all kinds of stuff via the GitHub and sample assets and add-on packs and all that kind of stuff as well. You don't really, really need to worry about all of those, the add-ons and so on. We're, we're not. All we really need is Unity and Visual Studio probably 2019 if you're uh, in, if you're downloading the latest one of the later versions of unity um, but all kind of crazy things and you know I guess you can get like a sample Lego game and this is other a bunch of sample assets and all kinds of stuff don't worry too much about all that really just focus on downloading unity getting it on your computer getting it up and running uh, and so on you're not going to get a license key or or that it's just going to be linked to your account unity is you know likes to be live and connected and so on um, once you download one version, which is probably don't go with the you know beta versions, uh, and even 2020 is out and official, but you know, in terms of long term support and things, uh, there's some other versions, we'll be able to make do with with uh, variety in terms of versions. But I recommend whatever version you get this week. You know, when you set yourself up, you're probably going to be 2020. Yeah, 2020. Dot two dot. 2F1, I think, is was the most recent. Could have changed today. I don't even know. Could have changed yesterday. Unity does that to us. Changes all the time. The type of things we're going to be doing aren't going to be so cutting edge that we're going to really worry about that. We're not going to get into data-driven programming and some of the latest cutting edge stuff with some of the 2D lighting and all. We're, we're not going to need to be that cutting edge. So get a version, kind of stick with it, because you're not going to want to like 
suddenly if there is some crazy new feature or bug or issue, you know, we don't want to, we don't have the rug yanked out from underneath us at some point. All right, I'm going to check on my time here. 11.07, I'm doing great on time, I think. So get that. Stick with whatever version you get. Don't worry about always having the latest version. Probably don't want to get the always be updating the latest version unless you need to. All right. You can have multiple versions of Unity on your computer as well. And you can kind of decide because, you know, in the real world, there are people who are working on multiple games, you know, a game that they're still, you know, they started working on two years ago and it's not out yet. And they're still using Unity 2012 or not 2012, 2019 on that. But they're starting a new project and maybe they're using a new feature in Unity. So they're going to get 2020 for that one. And you can do that. You can decide. Um, so there's the Unity already knows about that issue. So let's see if this works. So some sage advice starting out with something new. Dude, sucking at something. First step toward being sort of good at something. Did that uh, come through? Did our sage advice come through? Basically, the first step, in case you didn't hear it, the first step at being good at something is sucking at it, is just being terrible, right? You have to you have to try it first. And, and nobody, almost nobody, is going to be great at something right out of the box, all right? So don't worry. Things aren't going to be perfect. You're not going to develop, maybe you are, and in which case, talk to me right away about this, that you're going to like the triple A title first thing out of the gate the first time you pick up Unity, the first time you write a C sharp script that's going to be, you know, pristine. And so don't worry. You know, we, we know that that's, this is going to be a learning process. Part of this course, the other challenge is managing ambition, right? You're going to be tempted to do this, right? You're going to say, all right, I'm going to make a masterpiece and something is going to catch your eye and become interesting. And it's going to become the most important thing. And without it, you're going to feel like you, you totally miss the boat, right? So, so one of the challenges is managing your ambition, making sure you're not getting drawn into the weeds by some cool feature or cool thing. Um, we're going to be very, you know, broadly focused in this class about, you know, getting the basics, getting, you know, a, a solid thing without getting distracted too much into the, the pickle mess in this, this video, right? It's easy to do that. Um, we're not trying to make really big, crazy, earth shattering games that will come later, right? We're going to be focusing very broadly. There's going to be a lot to do, a lot to digest, right? And also in order to get that done, time management will be an issue. It always is. It always is, especially when you're on your own, you're remote, you're going to be far more in control of your time than you might be on campus even, right? So be careful about falling behind. Right. This is definitely a eating an elephant eating class, right? You want to do it one bite at a time. You don't want to wait till the last minute. You don't want to wait till the last week to try to get it done, right? Because everyone then will be asking questions and suddenly you'll be dealing with the fact that, yeah, the version of Unity you have turns out it does have a bug or and so on, right? You want to be trying things as we discuss them in class or as we demonstrate them, as we talk about a particular feature of Unity, work on that. Right. Even if it means, you know, inventing some con uh, some some context to work on it in. All right. So try to get an early jump on things. All right. Don't let them go to the last minute, especially now. This semester is a little bit more compacted than normal semesters are as well. Like we lose a week here and there kind of thing. So we wanted to try to be proactive as much as we can. All right. Other thing in this class, there is no shame flute. And I was just thrilled to find, and maybe now, maybe this isn't as cool a, a, a demonstration as I, I thought, but I just thought this was the coolest thing when I found this. The shame flute, right? This was a medieval torture device. It was uh, used for shaming bad musicians. The neck of the musician was forged or forded through the upper round hole and the fingers were placed under the iron. So you'd like lock this poor musician in this stance of holding this, flute, the shame flute, the shan flute, uh, and be just publicly ridiculed because they had committed crimes against music, right? Shows uh, that they, the, uh, 
they were, you know, they were basically so bad that they needed to be made fun of. Right. There is no shame flute in this class. There is no, you know, we, we, like I said, there's lots and lots of different backgrounds. And, and if anything, uh, an obscure question, you know, helps. It adds things. It's some perspective that maybe I've, you know, forgotten about, or maybe somebody else is having an, an issue. And, you know, chances are, if you're thinking of something or you're, you're, you have a question about something, somebody else will as well. Okay. Important thing, asking those questions that you think maybe you're a little nervous about. Maybe you think like, well, maybe that's the dumb question, whatever. If you ask them early, they're not dumb. That's the smart move is to get those out of the way. When they start to become problematic, I won't call them dumb. When they become problematic is when you've kind of let them pass and fester and linger and so on. And then suddenly the simple question is at the end, it becomes more complex to kind of get them, you know, to backtrack them and kind of pull things out again. So it's better to ask ob what you think may be an obvious or silly, qu whatever it is, there, there are no questions like that. You know, this is always just chances are it might lead to a different way of doing things. That's usually what it is. It's like, oh, you know, there's no one right way to do something. There's always like different perspectives. And, you know, you might be thinking like, well, why didn't, could I do this? And chances are, it's just, you've discovered or you're thinking about things in a different way. And that's good, you know, so ask those questions. Use direct message if you don't want to ask in front of, you know, with the whole, uh, in, in the whole general channel, you want to direct message me about that, feel free. That's awesome. But do ask questions, do interact, right? The secret is often enjoying the challenge. Um, I always love, this is the tough thing about online, I can't say, like, okay, who has heard of the legend of, of Sisyphus or the myth of Sisyphus? Okay, I got a, a hand, thank you so much. Somebody's, so Sisyphus is this tragic figure who is, uh, has been cursed by Zeus, I believe, to basically push this rock up the hill every, every day. I think it was, I forget if he was published for, punished for uh, stealing fire or something. I forget now. And the problem is, okay, you know, Sisyphus now as punishment has to roll this rock. Yeah. Ah. Cool. All right. More detail that I have just watered down in my in my constant repeating of this. I should I should have the okay. So the main thing though, the challenge, the 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 punishment was that Sisyphus had to push this rock up the hill. And the moment it got to the top of the hill, it would just roll down again. And then the next day, of course, Sisyphus would have to push the rock up the hill again. So this is eternal damnation of just this task that can never be done. Now, what if, for some reason, Sisyphus actually enjoyed physical fitness and exercise and working out at the gym? Well, in that case, now this might not be a, a punishment at all, right? If you enjoy what you're doing, the act of doing it, even if it's over and over again and so on, you know, that's not so bad, right? Some people you can you can just enjoy programming for the sake of programming or enjoy the development process for the sake of doing it. Don't worry too much about the end result or don't worry, you know, hey, if you write one game, chances are you're gonna have to write another game at some point. You know, there's never gonna be that one thing that, you know, don't get too caught up in, in the end result. Enjoy the challenge, enjoy the process, learn from that. That's my, my main point of bringing up our friend Sisyphus here. Um, so, okay, now we're going to bounce back and forth a little bit. So we're going to enjoy the process. We're going to work on things and so on. Uh, as part of that process, you're going to be tempted to, tempted by other things. You're going to, you're going to cheat death and we don't want you to cheat death. We don't want you to steal fire. Okay. Uh, for that, there will be punishments. Okay. How was that for a segue, right? Third party stuff, stuff you shouldn't be flying too close to the sun with. Okay, now occasionally I'm gonna provide template packages that's gonna have some piece of code that's gonna be some kind of skeleton to make sure that we're all using the same thing, you know, a set of common um, a common stages in, in a game or, you know, some common controls on the screen. So provide packages for you to use that with. 
outside of those, any code that you develop should be original. You shouldn't be using any packages, anything like pathfinding, any kind of camera control, anything that's kind of, you know, anything that you think fits under the that those auspices, that definition of coding that I just mentioned, okay? You might have, well, I'll get to it in a second. We'll just say no code libraries or templates or kits or, you know, first person shooter kit, nope, not allowed. You know, Pathfinder kit, not allowed. AI kit, not allowed, okay? Unless you can, can formulate a compelling reason that you know you want to work with them and you want to ask me about them, then perhaps maybe 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 there's a one percent chance but this course is more about the originality of the code and seeing you know you develop proficiency in that so yes absolutely and i would expect you to okay um, because what's going to happen is you're actually, even though you're going to have multiple projects, they are all going to be, going to be, well, multiple projects in terms of the class, they are all going to be housed within one project as far as unity goes, right? So reusing code is actually encouraged, encouraged in terms of using your own code. And we're going to discuss how to properly write a library, right? So that you can use it in that broader context. So as long as it's your original code, that is absolutely fine. You're going to be able to also use code from class. I expect, you know, some of these are going to be examples and there's going to be like, you know, the way to do it, quote unquote, you know, with regards to some simple mouse movement and so on. So I'm going to expect to wind up seeing code from class in your code. If you are using code from the class, from lectures that I've put up there or other sources, I expect to see you add comments and write it in such a way and, you know, not just comments, but potentially variable names and uh, routine program methods, you know, structures and so on that allow your personal voice to come through to show that you understood it, right? So that I can say, okay, you know, if there's a chunk of code, I'm going to tend to demonstrate things and I'm not going to write comments. I'm going to talk about them as I'm doing them. Uh, as I'm demonstrating them and so on. So they would, you know, my comments are going to come through as as hopefully audible ones and interactive ones. But if you do want to, you know, freeze framing on a lecture and saying, oh, look, the code, there's what, what uh, Professor Amherst put down. If you use that, I'm going to expect you to, to be able to document that in such a way that I get a, a, a clue as to you actually understood that and you didn't just copy it off the screen, right? That's one of the challenges here. So you have to have things kind of come through in your own voice in the way that you are applying things and the way that you implement things. So, okay, yeah, I, I went rambling even more on the, I think because it it's, a, it's a great question and it's important to the whole topic. All right. So you can implement concepts you find, right? I don't expect you to be inventing, reinventing the wheel all the time, right? So obviously, you know, the way you, grab user input and say, you're not going to be inventing that from scratch. There's going to be, you know, common concepts, right? But generally there will be no third party scripts, libraries, packages, components, and so on, right? There's going to be things that are built into Unity, obviously, standard components and ways we're using the physics engine and so on. But you shouldn't be buying stuff, you know, third party packages and add-ons through the Unity asset store and things. And you, you know, you don't stay away from that. However, however, there's always the however. What about the artsy stuff, the other stuff in games, right? Are you going to be judged on your design and art skills? Nope. That's going to be the one area where you can, that I'm, I'm totally fine with pre-made assets, okay? So if you get a kit, and you can pull things from kits that that do have scripts in them, You'll find a lot of the time there's going to be like, oh, here's a, a bunch of sprites that are included in a kit, and they give you some kind of demonstration of it. Using the sprites from that context, I'm okay with that. Don't use the scripts, right? So if you want to go to Kenny on itch.io or Kenny.nl and use, you know, their fantasy town kit, or you want to use, uh, you'll see the various brackies, uh, various. Uh, um, buyout, uh, there's all sorts of kind of standard things that we wind up using. So assets like that, visual assets, totally fine. If you want to develop your own, that's great too. 
if you want to take something and then animate it, that's great too. Um, but I'm not going to judge, you know, I'm not going to be judging your art in this, in this, uh, game or in this, in this class or really your design per se, we're going to be kind of more focused on core mechanics as opposed to really, really kind of out there creative as uh, creative applications of things. So we're going to be, always be doing that, you know, following that line. Same thing goes for sound and music. I'm going to recommend you not use pop music. You know, don't use your favorite song. Some people do. If there's like some kind of compelling reason that you want something to come through, I'm okay. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, sick the lawyers on people and say, ah, you must have cleared it through a certain artist and, you know, through RCA music. Well, you know, I'm not going to worry about that. Um, however, it's going to be in your best interest to keep it as copyright friendly as possible. So you should be trying to use, you know, royalty free things, um, sounds, loops, and so on, as opposed to just grabbing your favorite artist's music and putting it in your game. Um, so, but you don't have to do all your own sound recording. You can. Sound is a really, there's actually, you know, really simple ways and, you know, open source and easy, easily used tools. The same thing goes for, for uh, graphic art as well. So feel free. Just don't get bogged down in it. I'm going to not going to be judging those pieces. I'm going to more, you know, it'd be a shame that if you spent lots and lots of time working on original artwork and missed the programming piece of it, that's going to be, I have to judge, you know, the, this class has to give you a grade for the programming part. So you, you know where it's got to kind of come from, right? This is intro to game programming after all, right? We have to be, you know, now we're writing code, you know, there we are we be in that part. All right. Whew. All right, so we have C sharp, we have potential assets from the web and so on. So that's that should be everything we need to get going. Wait, there's more. And this is a new, this is a ne relatively new thing. All right. Perhaps you hate typing. Perhaps you hate the, uh, the notion of scripting. Now, one thing that has happened fairly recently within the last, I guess it's, yeah, still within the last year, eight months or so, is that there's a, <clears throat> a visual scripting language for Unity, which is older than that, which has been around for a little bit longer, considerably longer. Um, but recently, the company that makes this programming language, this visual scripting language called Bolt, has licensed it, sold it, and so on, to Unity. So it has become sort of the de facto visual programming or visual scripting language of Unity. Uh, if you're familiar with Unreal, the Unreal Engine has, you know, you can program Unreal using C++ or you can use Blueprints in uh, Unity, uh, in Unreal. So now Unity has decided to make Bolt sort of the official visual programming language in Unity, just like Blueprints are the official scripting, uh, visual scripting language in Unreal. Other languages, other engines have similar things. You'll find these kind of visual scripting tools or node and wire tools, kind of flow diagrammatic tools uh, elsewhere in, uh, in other applications as well. And sometimes there are also special use cases where we're doing like shading. You may have seen shader graphs and, and stuff like that, which is another concept of this kind of application of visual programming. So we're going to do touch on that a little bit. Um, you probably won't develop a whole game using visual scripting, but it's something to definitely be aware of. And we're going to at least, you know, have a couple of classes to talk about once we get the base unity concepts under our belts and the basic programming concepts under our belts, we can kind of, kind of, uh, um, uh, contrast back and forth. What it would mean, how would we do that in a traditional language versus how do we do it in a visual programming language? Right. So that's that bolt is a free package for visual scripting in unity. And there's all sorts of great tutorials and more in-depth, basically anything you can do in C-sharp, well, probably, mostly. And uh, you don't have to do necessarily one or the other either. You can actually use both of them. You can have certain objects and components that use Bolt, certain objects and components that use C-sharp. Um, and you can you know, kind of use the two together as well. Uh, Bolt has a little bit more you know, baggage that comes along with it. It's a little bit heavier. You have to, you know, install it. It is an additional install. So it is a package that you would, you're not going to get right off the bat when you install Unity. So wait on that for now. Okay. So don't, don't be like installing Unity and going like, well, where's Bolt? Where's Bolt? 
it's 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 an a, an extra add-on. Don't get too caught up in that for now. But we'll we'll talk about this. Whew, sip of coffee. I can do that. Just wet my whistle with some coffee. Ah, pause on this screen for just a moment. All right. The bulk of what we're going to do in this class, assignment-wise, comes down to four projects, right? Um, and they're going to be sort of, I mean, they do scale in the term, in terms of, you know, the challenge and how immersive and what concepts we're using. So we're going to build on things. So I do expect in certain circumstances, uh, to, you know, certainly see a lot of things, a lot of techniques you're going to wind up using that you learned that you demonstrated on the first project are going to get used in the last project. You know, how you used scenes, how you use the GUI, how you use the UI, how you use the canvas, that's going to carry out through the rest of the, all the games. Uh, and again, these are going to be concepts you use no matter what programming you do, right? So they are going to build on one another, but they're not necessarily going to be like, oh, level two of the game is project two. That's not necessarily going to be the case, but it kind of can be. And um, I'll, I'll show you some examples of that uh, as we sort of get around to it. Now, so there's four sort of distinct components. They used to be four entirely separate games until it dawned on me that I can, I can make my life as well as your lives easier by combining them into different kind of sort of stages or different pieces, mini games. Think about it however you want within one larger project. There's a, a bunch of reasons to do it that way. I'll discuss in just a moment. So the first project is a very simple text and audio adventure. It's meant to have minimal graphics almost no graphics, right? There are, there are, believe it or not, games that really focus on adventuring through creating an audio environment and minimal, you know, kind of visual uh, uh, parts of the game. We're kind of going for something along that, along those lines, right? And we can use this to introduce a lot of C-sharp concepts, maybe Bolt and so on. Uh, we're going to get to know our way around the Unity ed editor and basic Visual Studio community. We're going to learn some basic debugging techniques. We're going to learn the core kind of heads up display of Unity, which is the canvas and the UI system. We're going to learn some basic things about Unity objects and components. And I like to personally, I push this uh, to get audio involved as soon as possible. I do not like audio to be an afterthought in games, right? A lot of people do that where they're like, oh, okay, develop a whole game. And then at the end, we add a soundtrack and some sound effects. Not a fan of that. I like for audio to be just as much, have just as much a seat at the table as graphics, right? Because you really shouldn't even be thinking of something strictly in terms of graphics or audio. You should be thinking of these objects as things that have real presence in your game and interaction in your game. And they should be, you know, very seamless in terms of the, the way that they present themselves in their modalities, right? Audio is a modality. Visual is a modality and so on, right? So we're going to get our basic concepts and interactivity in there and some brute force programming in there as well. We're going to be doing kind of, you know, stuff that later on we're going to say, well, why did we bother to do that by hand? You know, why do we do it the hard way in the simple audio and text adventure? You know, taking, you know, actually moving an object around the screen programmatically as opposed to just letting the physics engine do it. Right? So we have that first one. And that should take a couple of weeks, but not you know, not a big thing. And it's going to be you know fairly uh, kind of uh, prescriptive in terms of how to develop that. The Apple Pickle Picker will be the first real sort of arcade game we're going to sort of do. It's based on the game Kaboom. Uh, there we're going to learn about C sharp collections. We're also going to learn some basic things in terms of the lifespan of an object and component in Unity and how they start to interact with one another, how they fit into the, the engine large, uh, at large. You know, they have things like start and update and on collision. So we have objects that start to interact with one another. Then we look at Unity prefabs, which are kind of, you know, higher level uh, collections or potential collections of objects and so on within Unity. Uh, get into more user input in kind of a more interactive way, using the mouse, potentially using the joystick, and so on. Scripted behaviors. So an object can be sort of have a, a, uh, a, a life of its own, you know, very limited AI. It's going to have a, you know, we have certain things going to have behaviors of their own. 
We're going to be making decisions in real time. The first game, it will feel sort of real time, but it's going to be turn-based, right? We're going to have a set of controls on the screen. The user is going to click this button, click that button. Something's going to happen in response to a button being clicked or user input. Things aren't going to necessarily happen in real time where, you know, if you just let it sit there, you, you, you know, you'd lose the game because everything would happen without you. You have to keep up with it. The first game is going to be very turn-based so that this sense of time is going to be driven by the user and, you know, clicking and so on. The second one is going to be more real-time straight up, right? There's going to be things where you start to use physics and colliders and so on. The second two projects, the shoot 'em up or the bullet hell RPG top-down, you know, sort of game. Now the second two are really going to be where you can, you know, kind of, push the boundaries, less prescriptive, less, you know, the game has to do this, this, and this, as opposed to now it's going to be, okay, let's make sure we can use the concepts that we've been learning in, uh, in more creative ways, as well as using, you know, making sure we understand how certain features are used, right? So it's going to be definitely much more involved and much more, you know, things that are going to wind up being probably portfolio or, you know, things that you're going to, you know, learn or, or you know, have put your personal touch on more. You're going to be the second two projects. So the shoot 'em up the bullet hell is basically a, sort of a top down game. Uh, let's see the list here. Debugging 2.0. We're going to definitely get into Visual Studio really kind of not just to, you know, print out the values that we would, you know, using the console that we might do in these simple debugging starting off. Now we're really going to get into debugging, you know, line by line and so on. Uh, we're going to talk more about math, angles and rotations, how objects move, we're going to start getting into some serious C and computer science concepts like inheritance and object-oriented programming. We're going to do some stuff in animation, coroutines. So we're going to like have this whole notion of okay, how do things get done in parallel? How do these? How does the engine kind of do these things on our behalf? The game itself is going to be fairly top-down 2D physics, but no no gravity. Right? We're going to be shooting bullets, and they might have friction. They might have a certain inertia and so on, but we're not going to worry about gravity so much, right? The environment is going to be, you know, fairly top down and limited, right? That's how I'm, I'm kind of dividing the the idea of the shoot 'em up bullet hell RPG from a platformer game, right? We have some basic enemy enemy AI in this game. We have some aiming and shooting and scripted 2D motion, right? So the this is going to be cool from the player control and the enemies and how they move and a little bit about, you know, how things interact. And then in the final project, we're going to add a lot more in terms of events, more in tile maps and camera motion, uh, more advanced physics techniques that, that come into, you know, creating a more rich uh, environment and interactions with the environment, like using joints and effectors and physics based motion along with scripted motion. Potentially a bit of 3D. Oh, sorry, I should warn you up front. Largely, we do we work in 2D in Unity uh, in for for this game for this excuse me for this class. Right, Unity is a fully capable 3D engine, and it's really even when we're working in 2D, we're working within 3D. Right. So don't worry about how much 3D art you feel comfortable with, right? Putting in the third dimension can be tricky, right? Especially if you're talking about animating a character or interacting with an environment, you're adding only one dimension on top of two dimensions, but adding that one dimension is gonna be a lot. Now, all of these things that we talked about are going to apply just as much when it comes to 3D, but we're gonna not do much in the way of 3D. We'll talk about the space that you're working in and, and how we kind of can potentially go there. But time permitting, maybe we'll we'll get into some of that towards the end of the class. If you already are very proficient and you've used Blender and created animations and skeletons and so on, you know, skeletal animations and so on, maybe we can push that a little bit sooner. We'll talk about how that works and how it relates. But a lot of the tasks are going to be focused on doing it within a 2D environment. Um, but Unity is very, very happy to do it in 3D as well. All right, so here's the, the, the shorter version if you're just following along in the slides. So, okay. And once again, the time, 11.37. Okay, we're getting, we're getting there. So one project to rule them all. The idea is that you're going to use a single overall overarching project that will have the other 
prototypes or other sub project as scenes that you're going to then uh, use. Okay. So you can have a main screen and you can, you know, get more elaborate with this. I will provide a prototype to this, uh, this week. All right. So there'll be some simple things with regards to, okay, your basic screen is going to be, you know, get as fancy as you like with backgrounds. Um, but you're going to be able to click a button to launch the adventure game or launch the apple picker or launch the shoot 'em up, launch the platformer and tell a little bit about yourself <clears throat> or about the class, whatever you want to do. Okay. So the nice thing about this is there will be just one thing and you'll always have that one project to refer to. And it enables us to set up the unity team seats and collaboration just once, right? So in terms of once you do this, once we get this out of the way in the first project, you will kind of automatically submit your projects even without knowing them as things go forward. There's a lot less managing of things <clears throat> as a result by doing it as one project, right? So I wind up with 47 projects instead of a hundred and you know, yeah, you know, that many projects to deal with. So from my perspective, it makes my life a lot easier uh, to deal with. And it also makes it support wise a lot easier to deal with. If I only have, you know, one project per student, then we can go and jump back and forth in whatever portion you're working on. That's great. It makes life much, much, much easier. So as you're creating your first project, if you're just kicking the tires on Unity this weekend, don't worry about naming things in such and such a way. But <clears throat> You are going to, the one that you wind up submitting and telling me about and putting me on the, the team so I can pull your code and help you debug and so on. It's going to be important that you name that correctly. Um, <clears throat> yeah, let's see here. Uh, you can hold, as you mentioned, I guess, yeah, here we go, mentioned it here. Um, there, let's see, we can, yeah. So this is sort of homework zero, whether you're not, whether or not you, Take this part where you create the 2D object, you know, be careful about that. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit more next time as well and have the Unity team collaborate feature works. So homework zero is to create an account, download Unity's student version, make sure you get Visual Studio 2019. Chances are, hopefully, who knows, maybe by the end of this class, it'll be different already. But 2020.2.2 F1, I think was the latest. Uh, the normal route, you can go through and just uh, go through, start at Unity, follow all the the links and so on, or sometimes you can kind of cheat and get through and go directly to their download archive. You used to be able to maybe licensing change nowadays. And <clears throat> ultimately to collaborate between you and I, you're going to be creating a specific project that you're going to work in. So unity is kind of weird. Once you create a project with a name, it almost never goes away, right? Unity loves to just like create it once it winds up being part of your online repository. It's there locally on your machine. It's, you kind of get stuck with it. So be careful about naming, you know, kind of creating your first project or creating another project or, you know, it's, it, it becomes a little, sometimes a little bit painful. Uh, you want with all these potentially den projects, you know, another version of the project, my first project, first demo, first, whatever, don't ever accept the default project names if you can avoid it. Um, so be careful about naming and creating projects because you would be surprised they wind up, you know, taking on a life of their own and just living beyond. So be a little careful about that. As you go through things, you may be asked to create an organization uh, during setup, I think you might even, uh, or maybe once you set up the collaboration system. So you're going to want to, uh, anything you share with me, I'm going to want to see your RCS ID on, right? Because I'm going to be presented with dozens and dozens and dozens of projects. When it comes time for me to try to, you know, find yours, I'm going to search for your RCS ID and all the projects that I am part of. Um, so having your RCS ID in the project name of the thing that you wind up submitting is super, super important. It makes my life much easier and therefore your life much easier. Um, so <clears throat> we'll talk about, you know, kind of go through this process explicitly next time as well. So here we are, download Unity, do that. Uh, there are a few components. So as you're downloading it, you'll notice you're, you should be given the option. Make sure you download Visual Studio Community 2019. Uh, I don't think it's the mono developed version on the Mac anymore, but it's basically we're going to be using C Sharp development tools. Two other pieces. Uh, you can install these after the fact. Um, and if you are running on the Mac, I'm not sure you're going to get Windows build support or not. I forget now. 
Uh, the more important of the two is going to be this WebGL build support. Okay. Uh, these are optional steps, but they're going to allow us to do something that is going to be important, which is, first off, if we have WebGL HTML5 support, you're going to be publishing your games, you self-publishing, whether you, you know, really decide to publish and put them out there, that's all up to you. But we're going to go through the process of publishing our games on itch.io, right? So you're going to ultimately, you're going to set up an account on itch.io, and we're going to be pushing games up there that will be playable through a browser, right? WebGL allows uh, the Unity engine, is a, a Unity can wrap itself and encapsulate itself in such a way that you can directly deploy your game on the web, you know, play it through a desktop browser. Um, so we're going to want to do that. And the nice thing about that is that it proves your game works as intended, right? If it plays through your browser correctly, chances are it's going to play through my browser or anybody else's browser correctly. So you don't have to worry about it not working on my machine when I go to grade or working kind of weirdly on my machine. And you can also, of course, use it to impress your family, friends, and potential collaborators and employers. I like for people to see other people's projects because when you get to game dev one or game dev two, and you're going to start together to have options for teams and so on, it's nice to be able to have, you know, potentially familiarity with what other people have done. You can even start your own developer log if you like. Uh, you know, I like to see people working on things in the process. I don't like to see things just done at the last minute, right? That's one of the reasons we use this Unity Teams, you know, the collaborating and version control that's sort of built into Unity. This makes life much, much easier, right? As you do, as you save things, you can directly, you know, click a button, collab, and that will push a saved a backup version of your game, of your assets, of everything, push it up to the Unity team server so that it is saved. So if your computer has a problem, if your dog eats your USB stick that it happened to have your game on, don't worry, we can still get it from the web through the Unity team collaboration server as long as you have pushed up the versions. And I also like to see people making regular submissions, not waiting till the last minute and doing their whole project at the very, very last minute. So it provides backup. It provides version control. It also helps me to debug. If you have an issue, I can just go in and get the version. You know, it's all going to be set up perfectly on my machine so I can see what's going on. So that involves creating an organization and inviting members to participate or collaborate on your game, right? If you have the Unity, especially if you're the Unity student version, you'll have, I think, five seats that you can share with people. Don't share your stuff with anybody except for me at this point. I don't expect you to be collaborating. These are all individual projects in, in this class. Right? So important stuff. Maybe I'm overplaying this stuff. Uh, now it becomes it's become a lot easier since we said you know, one project per person. Um, but uh, get this right. You know, do updates so on we, you know the worst thing is like if we're still ah i didn't quite get where okay it's the second project we're still struggling with why i have you know why isn't sharing working right on your project Ugh. anyway so in general start to wrap things up here so we're going to cover in this class things iteratively and recursively we're going to be constantly kind of adding things to our our palette to our quiver we're going to be doing everything from design to implementation so you're going to want to start things with a plan. Think about your game, how you're going to implement things, how you're going to make, you know, put your stamp on them. Um, generally, each project, it's good to have a plan early on, especially for the second two projects to say, okay, all right, for a top down game, what do I want to do? How do I want my level to look? How do I want my world to work? Right? Having that, you know, creating a plan early on is going to help keep you on track, solidify your ideas and so on. Right? It's going to teach you about the basics of game architecture and how engines work. We're going to learn about programming and scripting, of course, and math, timing, physics, user interaction. We're going to learn about asset management and use. So a little bit about how we import things from other applications and how we might author things and other tools to make them work well here. We're going to have some basic AI. That types of AI is going to be you know, kind of dumb AI in here. So don't get too excited about, you know, we're not going to be using neural networks or deep learning or anything like that but kind of core fundamental arcade level AI at least um, in here. So it'll be fun. Some character control, animation, automation, cam uh, character control and camera control, and then some basic bugging, debugging techniques, programming practices and collaboration. Oh, okay, almost forgot. Good thing I have these reminders in here. 
introducing a new concept, putting this in sort of all the classes, especially with regards to you know remote. So there, you'll notice if you've gone through the whole syllabus, uh, mentioned this thing called a participation quiz. And the purpose is really just to make sure that you've been awake and paying attention in class, doing the work on the projects yourself. If you do those things, it should be a breeze, right? These are the part generally what would normally be the participation points in class. It would be easier in person to deal with. It's just basically to make sure that you've done more than cut and paste code. If you have cut and pasted code and you didn't have some you know, basic ideas like, well, why was that? You know, why did we use time, delta time instead of just using time, you know, or, or, you know, why did we use, you know, what is the relationship between a component and an object? What is, you know, when I grab the mouse, why did I do this? You know, some, some reassurance to me that you have been actually doing things and not just cutting and pasting. So it's going to be a very simple participation quiz. It's not going to be a stressful. It's not going to be a math sort of figure out in 3D space, where is this going to be using this technique and so on. It's, that's not what it's meant to do. It's really just meant to make sure that you are focusing on the concepts and, and doing your best to kind of keep up with that. All right. Whew. That's what I got for today. That takes us to 1148. Pretty good, right? We're supposed to go to supposed to go to 12. Is that right? I forget. Anyway, that's enough for one day. So you've got homework zero, which is basically install Unity. Maybe if, uh, you know, look around, see what uh, other tutorials and resources you might find interesting. Look around at the Unity Asset Store. Um, you know, go to itch.io. Look for you know indie games for inspiration and so on. Not going to get super heavy into things this week. Uh, and participate in the Discord channel. So that's another way to engage. You know how people are getting along and uh, working. You know, digesting the ideas and digesting the concepts and so on. Um, there's the general schedule. Uh, also, so if we go to LMS, on LMS right now, we have, of course, the lecture. And let's see, content here. We have lecture notes and materials, and we have the syllabus with schedule. And so within there, the main pieces, of course, some stuff about the grading and participation and general boilerplate policies, be a good student, be a good citizen. And of course, when things are due and what we're going to be covering. If there's no questions, um, we'll end a little bit early, get our, everybody a chance to spend a little extra time on lunch. And welcome to the semester. And hopefully, uh, it'll be a pretty good one, even given the considerations that we are all remote. Thank you very much. Thanks for your attention. And I'm looking forward to seeing what you're all capable of. We good? Switch back to. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Usually that license that they're talking about, the thing that takes time, is getting the um, the additional assets. Like you should be able to go through and already, hopefully you're able to download Unity. You should be able to do that fairly quickly. That's all you really need. The other stuff, the other stuff is like, oh yeah, they want to send you some sample games and you know, kind of more in-depth stuff. So you shouldn't have to worry about that. Good question. You're not not the first person to encounter that. Yes. Oh, you're muted. Set to run Unity wise. Um, as long as the editor opens up, generally, that's a good sign. That's that's all you need to to get started. Um, so if you get if you can get the editor up and running and you see a scene and you can you know that's that's ninety percent ninety five percent of the of the thing. And chances are it's good. If you've got the editor open, you're you're pretty much there. Um, 
we'll next time I'll start to demonstrate, you know, using the Unity editor along with Visual Studio. Uh, so for that, you're gonna want to you're actually gonna need to like create a script component and then open that up, and that will wind up launching Visual Studio 2019. Um, so we'll we'll kind of go through that. But chances are if if Unity is already launching on your desktop, that's most of the battle. All right. Okay, take care. See you all on Friday.